Janae in post-production. Okay, without further ado, I'm excited to turn the mic over to our first speaker, speaker today, Dr. Kristen Palmer. Kristen is the Director of Online Learning Programs at University of Virginia. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about our global outreach program that we have in Africa and kind of go through what we've been doing there, um, what our impact has been, and a little bit about how we're using the community of inquiry and addressing um, global outreach and trying to build a community. So first of all, I know it's Northwest eLearn and I live in Bend, Oregon, but I live in, I live in Bend, Oregon, but I actually work for the University of Virginia, which is in Charlottesville. The University of Virginia, it's a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was created by Thomas Jefferson TJ. He is alive and well on the campus and we talk about Thomas Jefferson all the time. It's a public R1 university. We have about 25,000 students. It was founded in 1819, um, 13 different schools. And in 2012, we became a partner with Coursera, which um, relates to this program. So in our university, and I assume many of you have the same type of uh, priorities at your universities, we, we try to give global experiences to all of our students. And uh, specifically back in 2012, we had a group of MBA students that went as part of their elective to Uganda and they, they were business students and they created this business plan for having an African learning ecosystem um, where they were trying to build up a learning community. Um, so they pinged me as the person for online learning and said, hey, can you help us at all try to make this happen? Um, it's a student-led initiative and we really, we think there's a great opportunity there for outreach, potentially research, um, can you help? And so we decided we would leverage our open educational resources because at the time Coursera was all free for everyone. And uh, we currently have about 55 different uh, massive open online courses, MOOCs, on that platform. Uh, I think we've got five different specializations, but we decided to leverage our OER specifically with our Foundations of Business Strategy um, and offer that to uh, a university in Uganda. And then we also partnered with a local nonprofit that's actually in the Washington, D.C. area and Kenya. They have headquarters there, Distance Education for Africa. And we use them as a partner for um, that kind of local community support. And um, through the course of our first year, we identified mentors in different regions and we widely utilized WhatsApp for building community and answering questions, sending out notices of new classes that were coming up um, and FAQs. It was super helpful to have ideas for um, how to answer questions. So I tried to utilize the community of inquiry framework COI for making this program successful. It is a global outreach program. We have done extensive research with uh, the participants in the program. Um, and this is when I was looking at the three lenses of community of inquiry, addressing the cognitive presence, that was pretty easy. That was Coursera, that was the meat and bones of our content on Coursera and just answering um, the FAQ questions that anybody could access. Looking at social presence, that was where we were relying pretty heavily on our partner that had a big footprint in Africa and local mentors. And then for teaching presence, <clears throat> we've tried this a few times, but there's a massive time difference. So it's a 15 hour time difference between uh, Pacific Standard Time and um, Kenyan time. Um, so we've done some Zoom sessions. We have tried with the faculty participating um, and also just the cohort. Uh, we do have mentors and this past fall we created an online orientation that was required before participating in the cohort. So just for reference, um, in case folks are not super familiar with MOOC completion rates, um, the typical MOOC completion rate on the Coursera platform for someone that's not paying for it is two to three percent. Um, so if you get a thousand people, you know, it's, it's a very small 
percent that will actually complete the course. So our first series of courses, we had five courses in the Foundations of Business Strategy. We had 94 learners that started mostly in Uganda and Kenya. Um, the process went over nine months. We had 27 people complete the five courses for a completion rate of 29%. So we were super excited about that. I was not super excited about the over 1300 support emails I got. Um, so it became sustainability became a conversation quickly in this process. Um, this is a not very pretty slide of where we are now. Um, so we've got our course data from 2019 below and you can see the courses that we gave. Um, we did start a women's only cohort. Um, you can see that with the public policy design thinking and digital transformation. Um, but the other four courses that were given were for the whole court, cohort, so women and men. But our completion rates vary from 21% to 72%. Um, and I'm looking at people that are accepting um, so that they've accepted into the class and then their completion rate versus people. We had people sign up on a Google form if they're interested and then we invite them. And then of the people that accept the invite, um, our completion rates range from 21 to 72%. January was of 2020 was when we did the mandatory online orientation. Um, that had a lot of pushback from the DeAfrica partners. And so we've suspended that from uh, July, we just started a new cohort with the Foundations of Business Strategy again. Um, but um, we'll see how, well, we'll end up doing the Community of Inquiry survey and see about teaching presence. Um, I have mixed feelings about mixing that online orientation and I've thought about maybe bringing those modules into the courses themselves, but um, that's a work in progress. From some of the research results we did, um, we did the community of inquiry survey for the participants um, back in 2018. And then this was the results looking on um, the really the ethnic groups had a big, there was a significant difference with each of the factors, age and education level had a difference. Um, and there was a suggestion that perhaps we do customized videos um, to increase the community of inquiry. Um, uh, the feel of the presences. This is what it's looked like. If you can see, it's rather small, but we've, we've hit about every country except for Libya <laughs> in Africa at this point, um, which is super exciting. And we've given over 8,000 scholarships um, since we started in 2016. Um, so that's exciting. And we still keep on building the program. Uh, my biggest concerns are around sustainability. And so many of the participants in the program have been from businesses in Africa. So Kenya Airlines, you can see in the upper left of the slide, the different groups that have been businesses that have participated. And so I've worked with our partner to Africa to look at maybe doing consulting with um, those businesses to see if that might be a way to make this program sustainable. Um, in the upper right, I've gotten I've done lots of presentations on this and we've done research papers on this, which is good for our public mission and our R1. Um, but um, we've also done partnering with different programs so on the, in the lower left of the slide, the Presidential Precinct Network is part of the University of Virginia. And so we've done free programs through the Presidential Precinct for Africa and Latin America. Um, and then just media of trying to let people know that this program exists and we're trying to scale it, but we really haven't found a sustainable model yet. So um, especially now that we're heading into post, hopefully post COVID times and budgets will be tightened. Um, it's one of the red flags of I, I worry about the future of this program because it, it's not a really sustainable model at the moment. Um, and then that was my last slide. I'm early. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. We have some questions for you, but we'll save those at the very end. So our next speaker is Ben Kang. Ben is the Acting Director of Academic Technology Services and Innovation at the University of Portland. Ben, do you have slides that you want to share? I do, and I'm sharing them now. So I'm assuming everyone can see my desktop. Yes, that's correct. Perfect. Okay. 
And now I'm assuming everyone can see my slides. Perfect. Great. So thanks for the introduction, Weiwei. So yes, my name is uh, Ben Khan. I'm the Acting Director of Academic Technology Services and Innovation at the University of Portland. Uh, another role that I have held uh, and actually still continue to perform the duties for is called a Technology Solutions Architect. So as part of that, I look for you know, technological opportunities to bring different services and um, you know, technological sort of advances onto campus. Um, big part of that is like integrating things into our learning management system, but also looking for ways that we can utilize sort of these emerging um, technologies like open source technologies that are free to, to use and also cloud technologies that can be very efficient um, to, to um, apply towards different projects. So like a lot of the time it might be something like for a research project, we just need a server that we can spin up to like crunch numbers or run simulations um, or that sort of thing. But um, I did want to, as part of my explorations, have a look at podcasting because it's a personal interest of mine and we got questions all the time on campus about podcasting. So this is a little bit different of a, a presentation from uh, Dr. Palmer that we just saw because first of all, this one's a little bit more on the technical side. And also um, this was really a proof of concept that I developed. It has not been fully rolled out um, to the campus. So we're just gonna go over sort of what building this looks like and what um, tools and components I kind of selected and recommended as part of my test build here. So I do uh, briefly want to speak to just even what is a podcast, uh, just to make sure we have that concept in mind, because I'm sure many of us have recorded some audio and maybe you upload it to your Canvas or your Moodle page and share it with your students. So what differentiates an audio recording to a podcast is really the distribution method. And um, it's, it's an open distribution method that anyone can subscribe to your podcast on different um, podcasting directories that are out there. Of course, the most famous one that everyone knows is Apple Podcasts, formerly known as iTunes. Um, but of course, if you're like a Google user or you use Spotify or you use one of the more specialized services like Stitcher, um, you can use the same technology and the same protocols and, and uh, systems and make your um, content available wherever people happen to be. So to me, the value for education, when we talk about centering our you know, um, content design on our learners or meeting our learners where they are, uh, a podcast can really elevate the effectiveness of an audio recording um, because it is in that kind of serialized format. So all the student needs to do is subscribe to it the same way that you know, maybe they're into uh, NPR podcasts or like Joe Rogan or whatever it is that's sort of the popular material that they're into, they can get your content delivered the same way. And that makes it super convenient for them if they're, you know, busy parents or they have to be washing dishes or taking their dog on a walk. They might be able to fit in some engagement with your material um, in a little bit more informal way. So it's kind of an exciting thing to explore, I think. So, um, and what I'm going to be talking about is really the infrastructure that you can think about using to support podcasting um, at scale on a campus, right? So. Um, I think, um, again, a lot of us probably have experimented with doing audio recordings and tried different microphones and things like that. That's really not what I'm talking about today, uh, because I feel like that's pretty, uh, pretty within reach for most of us to start making recordings. Um, the question sort of becomes what comes next? Like, how do I turn my audio recording into a podcast? So really briefly, um, it's actually simpler than you might think. All you really need is somewhere to host your multimedia files, typically an MP3 file. Uh, you need to make that available on the internet so that someone is able to connect through one of those podcasting directories and download it um, onto their phone or, or stream it or however they want to consume that audio. Um, you also need a way to provide a RSS feed from your uh, media server so that these podcasting directories can allow people to subscribe. And whenever you upload a new piece of media, a new podcast episode, they're going to get that pushed out to them. So they don't have to worry about keeping up with your uh, material. It just shows up for them in sort of their feed. Um, and so RSS, if anyone is wondering, um, I think originally it, standard, it stood for rich site summary. It's one of those situations where we have what's called a backronym, where someone came up with something that makes more sense for the acronym than the original <laughs> uh, thing. So I, I usually call it uh, really simple syndication. It's just a way that you provide a link to someone, they get all the updates that you, um, that you push out from that link. The last piece that I mentioned is probably optional, I guess, um, for a podcast, 
but it's really nice to have a website where you can kind of aggregate all of your information. Um, if you have like show notes, if you want to provide links to the things that you were talking about in that episode, if folks are interested and they want to, um, you know, follow up and get more, more information about those things that you were discussing. Um, of course, if you want to be providing um, accessibility resources like transcripts and that sort of thing. So of course, it's just a good idea to have a website that you can make sort of your home base for your podcasting. So thinking about how could we do those things on a campus, um, I was trying to envision how can we make it so that we have a service if someone says, hey, I want to do a podcast for this course or um, you know, maybe student activities wanted to do a podcast about uh, campus life for students or something like that. How can we get them set up so that once they're able to do those recordings, they're able then to like get their stuff out to iTunes, Spotify, all those other places without all the cost and complexity of having to refigure out how we're going to do it every time. Um, and so some of the key questions that I was seeking to answer, right, is again, how can we support and scale this? Um, how can we make the system such that we own the platform and control the distribution. Because as we'll talk about probably on the next slide, um, you can certainly go buy a solution, but that's going to come with um, certain disadvantages into how you're paying for it. Um, and so how do, we, how do we do all this above in a manageable cost efficient way with only a very small staff? So my team is currently four people. Um, so of course you can you can buy it or you can DIY it is sort of how I came down on. Um, there's different places where you can go and you can buy basically a podcasting package. You could do it as simple as setting up a SoundCloud account um, or there's uh, specialized services like Buzzsprout and other ones. Um, but again, they're going to have those tiered monthly plans. So maybe you start with a monthly plan that you can budget for and afford and it would include up to five different podcasting shows that you could have or maybe up to a certain amount of data that you could upload every month. But what happens if you're actually successful in scaling this and you have more and more people wanting to participate, then you're having to go through and like refigure out how you're paying for it and, and all of that stuff. So I wanted to take again advantage of some of the technologies that are open source that are using cloud computing. So you're having a more predictable kind of um, growth cost associated with it. It's a little bit easier to um, maintain and make sustainable. Um, and so I guess if you've been watching so far, you know that I'm saying I, I'm going to DIY it, right? Uh, so just to give the broad overview of kind of the technologies that I chose to uh, run with in creating a proof of concept, um, I did go with a multi-site WordPress. Um, if you've never used a WordPress multi-site, I'm sure everyone's familiar with WordPress, but what a multi-site install of WordPress is, is it allows you to have one website essentially that has many subsites and as many subsites as you want. And each one of the subsites can have its own users with their own logins. It can have their own theme so it can look totally different. Um, its own content, obviously, its own media libraries. Um, so it's, it, it lets you serve a lot of different um, users and their websites under one sort of central admin sort of setup. Um, so it just makes, makes it much easier to manage. Another advantage of uh, WordPress, of course, is because it's so ubiquitous and popular, there are just so many different plugins that you can install to extend the functionality. So um, I use one called PowerPress, which is a podcasting specific WordPress plugin that enables that podcasting functionality on the WordPress site. And again, the key thing is there, it's letting us um, create that, f that feed that we can then use to distribute out to Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all those different places. Um, where the other piece of cloud kind of technology comes in because it doesn't, for a WordPress site, it doesn't matter if it's hosted on a, like a actual physical server on your, at your university or under your desk or in the cloud or, or whatever. It doesn't really matter as far as WordPress is concerned. Um, but what I wanted to utilize for the cloud is what's called object storage. So um, if you're using Amazon Web Services, their version of object storage is called an S3 bucket. And that's probably something that you have heard about before, but basically what it is, is just a super cheap, super robust uh, and, and uh, very reliable uh, way to store files. So if you're looking at the cost uh, for an S3 bucket, it's about 0 0.023 cents per gigabyte. A typical podcast episode is maybe going to be 25 or 100 megabytes or something like that. So you have quite a bit of runway in terms of your costs. It's going to be basically pennies and then maybe dollars as you scale out and get dozens or even you know hundreds of episodes and have a very, again that very predictable slow kind of growth curve associated with the cost there. 
Um, oh, and another sort of neat piece about WordPress is again, going back to the plugins, um, I was able to use a plugin that lets you just upload your audio file to your WordPress site. The plugin then grabs that file, puts it into an S3 bucket and deletes it from the WordPress site. So it, it very seamlessly for the user, it makes a difference for the, for the user, but it's storing the media in a very cost effective uh, way. So this is the demo site that I did spin up. If anyone wants to visit it, it is live right now. Um, so if you visit podcasts.atsi.rocks slash future learning, this is just an example of what a podcasting site um, that setup can, can look like. I didn't really do any extra design work or anything. I just kind of kept everything simple out of the box, just again, prove that it could work, right? Um, so let's look at sort of, of what that allowed me to do. Um, so again, I, I'm able to upload things, create posts and add audio into WordPress and then have that automatically show up in, for instance, like Apple Podcasts. Um, so again, meeting people where they are, if they wanna to go to your site and download or listen, they can. Um, if you wanna leave it open to a wider audience and let people find it through these podcasting repositories, uh, they can do that too. You do still have to add your feed to all of the different podcasting services. I wanna make it clear, it's not like, a magic process that PowerPress is able to submit your uh, show to all these different repositories uh, because they do have different standards. They need information um, for you to fill out like who's the kind of content owner, who's the host, uh, what's a link back to your website, uh, how do you want to describe, things like that. But it, it's very easy to do. And again, it does give you, once you are getting someone set up with this, a simple way to run through and say like, here's the popular podcasting repositories. You can add, or, add it, um, using this URL to what, whichever one of those repositories that you're interested in having your content available in. So this is what it's like to add a podcast feed into Spotify. Again, you can see it's pretty simple. You put in uh, three steps. So you're verifying your um, RSS link, you're adding your basic info, and then you submit it to them to review and then it shows up in the pod, uh, Spotify podcasting store. Back on the website, you also make it really easy for your potential listeners to choose how they want to consume your content, right? So this is just an example of what shows up on that site when you click that you want to subscribe. Um, so you have your Apple, Google, those are just uh, the ones that I kind of set up. Um, and then of course you just have that feed. So if you use like a specialty kind of podcasting app that's not listed, um, you can add it straight using uh, straight to your app of choice using that link. So when you're going through, um, and actually this is the, the WordPress interface. So um, an important part of this in, in choosing WordPress as the platform was it needs to be super easy for our end users, our podcasters um, to add their content. So you can see, uh, this is just going forward a page. Once something is filled out, the title of the blog post becomes the title of the podcast episode. The actual content of the blog post becomes the description that's then sent along as metadata with the podcast. Uh, and then right below your normal WordPress content, you just have these podcast settings. And again, it's super simple. I just leave everything um, at the default. So you just put in the URL for your media, click that verify URL button, it finds that. And then you don't have to do anything else. It just auto detects, you know, how large the file is, how long the episode is and, and pulls that metadata in. Um, this is just showing the uh, AWS portion. So as soon as you upload your file to WordPress uh, using this particular plugin, again, it just brings it over to an AWS S3 bucket, deletes the original file. And then in WordPress, you can just copy the URL. And um, that's just illustrating how I got the URL to paste into this podcast setting form. Um, again, kind of going with the benefits of using WordPress for this. Um, if you've ever used WordPress, you're probably familiar that you can publish your content right away or you can choose to schedule it later. Um, that's another problem that we had using some other kind of podcasting solutions on campuses like, well, if, they, if someone wants to record three, four or five episodes, how are they gonna like make sure that they're sticking to some kind of regular schedule and getting those out? Um, WordPress just makes that super easy. So that was uh, the end of my slides for today. Again, happy to answer any questions once we are at the end of our time. Great, again, we do have some questions for you and we'll save all those at the end. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. 
Well, last but not least, we have Stephen Schwiff and Todd Meislan from Columbia Gorge Community College. Stephen has recently retired as the Dean of General Education, and Todd is a full-time instructor in the Business and Entrepreneurship Program. Good morning, everyone. Can you see my screen? Is that working? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, good. So, yes, as um, I was introduced, I am a um, retired Dean of um, General Education at Columbia Gorge Community College. Um, I originally joined the college as an instructor in the business department and became department chair and then was called upon to help improve the um, business um, department's enrollment and um, course offerings and so forth. And so let me give you a little bit of background. Um, we are a very small community college. I think we're second or third smallest in Oregon. Um, I have the enrollment numbers, but the primary number that was affecting us was around 20 to 45 business students a year. And many of them were seeking the transfer degree, so they were taking just four or five business courses all year. But we also offered a management entrepreneurship program and an accounting program. And the, um, our service area was very large as well. We covered the entire Columbia Gorge um, scenic area. And so it goes, um, our main campus is in the Dalles, and we have a satellite campus in Hood River, but our region goes um, far east and as far um, west as Cascade Locks. And then we cross over to Washington and to um, as far as Stevenson uh, and so in Golden Dome and those uh, areas. And so we had students that were coming from all over. And because we had such a small business um, program, we were offering one class a year but you know, each class once a year and at a, at a certain campus. And so as we explored what would be helpful to the students, we came upon the idea of, of synchronous classes, broadcasting um, to the other campus from wherever our class was. So the idea was, unlike what we're doing right now because of the pandemic, to have a face-to-face -face class that would actively participate in person, but bring in, people um, synchronously to actively participate in the class. And so at the time, Zoom was new, at least new to us, but ODOT um, got the um, PEC to pay for a subscription for all the colleges. So that was the technology we were gonna use and, and now all of us are familiar with Zoom, um, probably because of that reason. So two years ago in 2018, we made the commitment we would synchronize every single business class. And so um, let's start with the good. Uh, students love it. And whenever I've had a student um, forum or talk to individual students, many of them will say they would not be able to continue with the program if we weren't doing synchronous classes. They wouldn't be able to finish in a timely manner. And so that was really gratifying to, to hear. Another, idea, another um, concept that we hadn't really considered was um, working parents when their children were sick or if they themselves, any student was sick, they could Zoom from home um, to the classroom. And so they didn't have to miss class and try to catch up. They could actively participate. Also, like we're doing today, all of the classes were recorded and posted on our um, L LMS, the Moodle system, so that if a student had to miss, they could catch up and see the classroom activities. Um, the instructors, there was some hesitancy at first. Um, not only did it mean learning Zoom and being able to handle really two diverse groups. Um, and uh, uh, my um, co-presenter, Todd Meislin, I'll introduce in a, in a few minutes, but he's going to elaborate on the instructor's point of view. Um, they learned <laughs> and they understood that it was really for the good of the students and for our program. And so I had no instructor cause you know, any kind of problems or, or complain too much, um, but they were faced with the problems that we'll get to in the bad and the ugly. Um, the, another good thing that came out of this was um, we worked with the um, technology. We jumped feet first with no budget, just the free Zoom from the state, and we learned how to make it work. And we were work using a webcam and a microphone and one screen, which is a technological um, difficulty when you're handling Zoom and, and a variety of class um, members 
um, zooming in from different places. But it really helped us solidify that aspect of the class, as well as create Zoom protocol that came in handy when the pandemic shut down our campuses um, last spring. Um, we have a Zoom manual for general use in the classroom. Um, Paula Asher, our virtual campus coordinator at the time, created a Zoom from home when it was clear we were closing the campuses. But we also had developed a um, Zoom stress test that we put through each business department um, instructor through to make sure that they could handle different problems. And of course, when we started, we had no idea what those problems were. And so without that startup time and the, and the work of the instructors and uh, Paula and myself, we would never, never been ready for the, um, for the shutdown in, in March. Now the bad technological problems. We've had anything from um, webcams not working, computers not working, um, sound problems, and I'll get to a few of those in the ugly. Um, not all faculty or students had adequate equipment. Um, we've solved that problem by having the face-to-face -face class. So if a student said, I, I don't have the internet at home, I can't join synchronously, we would say, well, unfortunately, you'll have to come to campus. And we have the same um, exact experience, and a lot of people would say better in face-to-face -face classes um, available to you. But still, we had a student um, reported to me that had to drop because they were basically ciphering off the internet from a neighbor, and it wasn't working well enough to keep up with the, the schoolwork. And um, in our area, um, there's um, sections of the um, of our service um, area that do not have internet at all, and they're trying to, students were trying to use their phones, and it was not a good situation. Now the ugly, um, we did have classes that had no sound throughout the class, so it was a silent movie for our students, which um, they didn't appreciate, <laughs> and that was something that we learned. Um, very quickly that you have to test everything. You have to test the sound every single time because even if it's a classroom, only the business instructors were using the same mic, same camera, just being shut down each night would change those um, systems. And so we had, um, in fact, when I was um, piloting the um, Zoom technology before introducing it to the rest of the business faculty, um, I just videotaped and used the technology in my face-to-face -face class. And I had an entire class that was without sound. And so we, we worked on it, but I had calls saying, you know, we can't hear, we can't get in, which is the next um, bullet point. If there was a missed link, if the teacher signed into the wrong um, class meeting, or if the students did, they would miss the class. And in one um, occasion, we would have the computer lab open on the other campus so that students could attend um, that way if they didn't have good internet. And the door was locked and they weren't able to get into the classroom um, for the first session. And so that was uh, very upsetting and we work to correct that once we get back to campus. So in the chat or after we, um, when we get to questions and answers, if you want to share some of your horror stories, um, I will um, be interested and in hear what you had to deal with. And now I'll turn it over to um, Todd Meislin, who um, joined us right as we were introducing the um, Zoom classroom and I'll let him take it from here. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Yes, I came uh, to the college originally in the Small Business Development Center. My background is not in education or uh, academics, uh, but rather as an entrepreneur, I've, I've founded and uh, built uh, three companies that I've uh, eventually sold. And so uh, when, I, when Stephen asked me to come into the business and entrepreneurship department, I didn't have any preconceived ideas of how it worked. And uh, I have taught face-to-face -face and synchronous classes or Zoom classes um, the entire time. So when COVID-19 came around, the only difference for me was there were no students sitting in front of me. Uh, you can go ahead and move that, Stephen. So uh, sticking with the theme, uh, there were, uh, I came up with three examples. Uh, first of all, as Stephen said, the students uh, really have loved the flexibility. Uh, I even had one student who had gone back to Ohio for a wedding or something, and this was during COVID-19, uh, actually joined class from inside her car Well, I assume her husband or someone else was driving her home. So the flexibility of uh, places that they can zoom in from is great. Um, 
uh, I had an older student who uh, was not particularly uh, full of technology, uh, technological aptitude, and she uh, kept appearing upside down uh, in her sessions. She did not know the problem. She couldn't figure it out. I finally had to tell her to turn off her her uh, a camera until she got it straightened out, which she eventually did just because it was too distracting. And then uh, probably my worst situation was uh, I exited the classroom one time uh, on a break. And when I came back to the room, just habitually, I shut the door. And when I came back, uh, my key card was inactivated and uh, the students were waiting for me to resume class. And uh, by the time I found somebody to let me in, because it was after hours, uh, they had all gone. I think it was around 45 minutes. So not the best experience, but uh, fortunately it only happened once. So I'm gonna break this down into a couple of areas, one being technology considerations, one being classroom management, although there is some overlap. So my biggest uh, admonition to people is to become familiar with the hardware and the software. Um, it's not enough just to know which buttons to push and uh, you know, just learn uh, the process by rote because often it doesn't work correctly. So I really recommend that people uh, on their own time go play with it, experiment with it, uh, break it, fix it, uh, so that you uh, learn what to do when it doesn't work properly. Because often you go to run the equipment and whether it's a camera or a microphone or uh, the Zoom uh, uh, application itself or the computer, Sometimes things don't work because someone else has left it in a different condition uh, than you left it or just, uh, you know, the gremlins in the system. Um, I always uh, arrive early to class or I have in the past. It's uh, now that I teach that no one else is in there because of COVID. I don't really have this problem, but uh, I really encourage you to play with it uh, a lot and experiment so that you're not uh, caught off guard when something goes wrong and you can troubleshoot. Uh, secondly, I would say uh, make sure that the equipment you have works properly. Uh, get an omnidirectional microphone, uh, especially for the people that are in the class, uh, so that those who are online can see them. Uh, having a camera that autofocuses and can zoom in is, uh, is beneficial. And then have some adequate lighting. This is something that I have to change uh, for next year. but. Uh, would make, uh, would make the experience for the online folks uh, much better. <clears throat> uh, if possible, I would use uh, at least two separate computers, uh, one for sh uh, screen sharing and the other to see the students in gallery view. I have a, a, a smart board I would suggest you use if possible. And uh, when that is logged in, that is my screen share and then I can still uh, put all of my students in gallery view and see them and face them and see if they're nodding off or uh, off doing something else. Uh, just facilitate stronger student interaction if you can see all of them, at least it does for me, and the students in the classroom can see them. Uh, we don't yet have a camera pointed back at the face-to-face -face students uh, because it hasn't been necessary during the pandemic, but that's something we'll be adding. Uh, and then in terms of classroom management, again, people have been using Zoom now, so maybe this is old news, but I would definitely use the waiting room function. Uh, this allows you to uh, make last minute changes, do uh, whatever needs to be done, run to the restroom, whatever it is, without uh, the students actually in class. What I typically do is about one minute before the class starts, uh, I start letting them in. Uh, secondly, I, uh, the college asks this as well, but everyone has to use their first and last names on the screen so that I know who they are and I also know whether they should be let in uh, via the waiting room. But I'm not trying to decipher a, uh, an email address, email address as to what that student's name is. Uh, we insist that students have their camera on uh, during the entire session. Uh, I also take attendance at the beginning of the class and I record their names both for participation, uh, but it also allows me to confirm that their uh, cameras and microphones are working. Um, <clears throat> uh, we insist that students are either in a room alone or using a virtual background. 
uh, not eating, doing chores. I've had uh, students stand up and fold their laundry and other things like that. Uh, texting, uh, spouses walking around in, uh, you know, underwear and that kind of thing. Kids, dogs, uh, cats, uh, all of that thing uh, are eliminated if you uh, ask them to do uh, that, that uh, virtual background or be in a room alone. Um, also insist, uh, I insist that they're seated and focused during the class. We take a break after each uh, 55 minutes or an hour so that uh, isn't too long to ask for some concentration. And then what you really have to do uh, is call on students to participate. Now this is true in a, in a classroom environment as well, face to face, but uh, I don't wait for them to interrupt or raise their hand. I can't even see their hand being raised because I'm not usually paying attention to the uh, chat version or, or the, uh, the computer, but if they raise their virtual hand, but um, I, I use my, uh, uh, roster that I've taken uh, attendance on and I check off who I've called on and how they've responded. Uh, and then uh, use Zoom breakout rooms. If you haven't used these, uh, these are great for having uh, small groups of students discuss an issue, uh, works well in my ethics class, and uh, then they come back together and discuss uh, as a group what they've, what they've discussed individually. Uh, lastly, uh, get up and move around. Uh, no one wants to see your face talking for three hours. And so uh, I actually stand in front of the smart board, move around a little bit. I think it's uh, better for me and for them. Uh, and then as Steven mentioned, uh, don't forget to record your classes and pause it on breaks. Uh, hopefully remember to resume. I only forgot that one time. Uh, you can post it on your LMS for absent students and uh, then I've also used it to watch my own performance uh, so that I can uh, stop paying, uh, improve uh, what I'm doing uh, as an instructor. And that's our presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Todd and Stephen. Um, I think we're now moving to our Q&A time. We do have a number of questions uh, recorded in back end. Um, we have a number of questions for each of the presenters. So I'm thinking maybe we can just um, do one question per, per, per presenter and then we'll come back to the first one. Um, GZ, would you like to read the first question for Kristen? Sure. Um, so this was from Emily and the question was, um, what do you think contributed to such a high completion rate? And that's yeah. the MOOCs, yeah. And so I answered that one. I think really it's the, you know, so I think there's a little bit that is what the topic is, you know, so design thinking, for example, is really hot right now for businesses. And so our design thinking class was pretty popular, but I think it was more the community. Like I, <laughs> I did my doctorate with Rena Paloff. I'm a big like community building community, the importance of peer to peer interaction, the importance of um, feeling like you belong as part of a community. And so really building that up in the cohort, we did a, a buddy system where you identified a buddy and then would check in with them to see, you know, keep each other accountable of, you know, are you doing your work or no, I got confused. Um, we also shared best practices. So, yeah, one of our learners was like, I put it on, I put on the, I, I download it with my mobile app. And then I, as I'm doing chores, I listen and, and just kind of sharing best practices. But, you know, I'm a firm believer in the importance of community um, and that that is why our completion rates were so high. Excellent. Thank you. Um, for Ben, there was a question from Christine. Um, are there any student information privacy issues with having students creating and publishing podcasts? Um, I think that there certainly could be. I mean, I know it's uh, sort of a, an open question around the practice of having students either, you know, write for an open audience or create other content for an open audience. It's something that I've been asked to do as a learner in the past. Um, so I'm not sure where that would fall down in terms of FERPA or just in how you want to, you know, think ethically about instruction and teaching. Um, but the idea that, that I sort of had behind the, the podcasting setup was to really eliminate barriers for the people that wanted to be doing podcasts. So it could be used in a classroom. You could actually um, create an RSS link and not publish it out to 
um, all of the different directories. It might be something that you just post for your students and let them subscribe to each other's podcasts. Um, or it might be something that student clubs want to use to publicize what they're doing. So um, there certainly could be, I think, problems with um, an instructor from that top down um, kind of approach saying everyone will podcast. I don't think that would probably be the right approach. Um, but the idea behind the technology was, again, just to eliminate barriers. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question for Stephen. Um, are there a mix of face-to-face -face and distance students in the synchronized sessions or just the instructors physically present and all students at a distance? And that one's from that. So that was the, the concept before the pandemic was exactly that there would be a face-to-face -face class and students in the synchronous um, section. So they're all together in one big group. And that's what Todd was discussing that it's, you know, it's, it's difficult because you can see the face-to-face, -face, but you have, you're wanting to make sure you engage the synchronous um, students. And so we ha do have a small rural grant to um, help us um, develop Zoom rooms as we're calling them, to set up cameras and um, TV screens so that everybody can see everybody. And that would be the perfect situation. Um, I really had difficulty when I only was using one screen because I was focusing on my PowerPoint or my, um, you know, the lessons and couldn't see any of the students. And so that's when you, you lose some people and they um, feel like they can turn off their cameras or they can go fold clothes, like Todd said. Um, and so it's very important that you always keep that in mind. And so it's almost easier doing what we're doing now, which is just a synchronous class or synchronous meeting like this one, because all you have to do is focus on your computer. And, and I found that when I was presenting um, today, because I hadn't really ever done that. I've always had a class I'm talking to while I'm um, um, sending the um, class out synchronously. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I'm curious if you, I mean, I, mean, I know there's probably more detail than we get into in the Q&A, but what sort of like audio feedback issues maybe arose or just problems with, um, again, like keeping an eye on, like how do, how do students at distance ask questions? Can the in-person students hear them like they can't hear each other. So a lot of the sort of procedural questions that I have, because we're of course looking at doing that in, right. our, in our classrooms. Yeah, and I would move the camera around. And like I told Todd, as we were preparing, I had my son who was um, off work, uh, school one day, take the camera around and film students as, you know, because we were doing business law. So we were going back and forth Socratically and that works. But of course, then you have to hire somebody to do that kind of that stuff. But Todd, do you have something to add? Well, yeah, we, the way it works, we run the, uh, uh, the sound through the, the speakers in the classroom, the overhead speakers, and then uh, all the students that are in class can also see I have the, the students laid out, uh, the online students laid out on a, on a screen in front of them, uh, the drop down screen, and so they can both see them and hear them, and then the microphone uh, that we have in the roughly the center of the front of the room uh, picks it up so that the online students can can hear them. But I was talking about those technological problems. One day I came in and I could barely hear everybody on online and uh, thought about it for a minute and realized there had to be an amplifier around there somewhere. And so I opened the cabinet and sure enough, somebody had, you know, uh, turned the thing down and I turned it back up. That's what I mean about being able to troubleshoot a little bit if a problem comes about. Excellent. Also, um, and if people aren't checking in the chat, Kristen also shared um, a resource uh, Clemson has for teaching with mixed classes and how to be effective with the um, in different interactions online. Um, I wanted to follow up with a question for Todd. Um, Graciela, uh, thanks you for your presentation. And could you tell us a bit more about the waiting room, how big is your class and how does it work? Uh, the waiting room? Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a feature that you turn on in your settings. Uh, in it, there are like a million settings in Zoom, so you got to scroll down quite a ways. But uh, when you set the waiting room on, what happens is uh, there's a little uh, chime that, that you know someone has come in, but they're sitting in a waiting room. They're not watching your live camera or anything that's happening in the presentation yet in the classroom uh, or meeting and then you see them by screen name and you can admit them one at a time. You can admit 
everyone who's in the waiting room at one time uh, all at once. Uh, <clears throat> it just allows you to manage it so that, uh, like I said, I wait right up until about a minute before class starts. And usually I will let them in one at a time as I check off their uh, attendance, uh, just saves me running around and, and finding them all later. Uh, but it's, uh, I've found it quite valuable uh, in terms of uh, managing who comes. Plus, I also find out who's late because uh, I start the class recording and then the chime comes on about 30 seconds into it and I see that, you know, Susie is late and I can mark her and it affects her attendance uh, points. Excellent. Great. Just to follow up on that really quick, sorry, GZ, to cut you off. Um, so I think there are some conversations within Zoom, the company, that they are actually looking at forcing either waiting room or pass passwords in September. So um, that's something that you might want to get on your radar to make sure that you are prepared for that. Well, I know they did, uh, they did default to those. Uh, they changed it a few, a few months ago to, well, not a few months ago, a month or two ago to uh, default to waiting room and passwords, but I had not heard that they were forcing it and not allowing uh, you to do it. The, the, the default to waiting rooms really had to do with the Zoom bombing that was going on and uh, trying to prevent that, which is another reason for having students have their actual first and last name on the sign in. Uh, uh, so that you know to let them into your class. Yeah, it's all related to the Zoom bombing <laughs> issue. And they changed the schedule, the forcing schedule a couple of times already. Originally they were talking about May, but then um, it, it was pretty challenging for many institutions because May is like in the middle of the quarter. Um, so now they're looking at September. That's the last I heard, things can change, so. One of the easiest ways to turn those things on is when you do your meeting, when you schedule a meeting, just look down all the list of boxes and you can do one of the, as um, Todd mentioned, there's a gazillion options, but essentially I think once you require the, um, the waiting room, then the following meetings that's automatically selected or opted in. Mm -hmm. But um, we have another question for Ben. Um, now that you are in this, do you think you chose wisely with the DIY versus buy? I'm curious from an institutional standpoint, what you'd recommend if someone is looking for a solution for across the institution, if you recommend the WordPress DIY or buy, and that's from Kristen. Yeah, I mean, I hate to give the standard answer, but of course it's gonna depend on your situation and the resources that you have to bring to bear. Um, I mean, and, and there's other questions to answer too. I mean. So for me, what I wanted to avoid was the situation where it becomes haves and have nots. Um, so you have to come up with that budget, that 15, even if it's cheap, um, whoever wants to do podcasting, I didn't want them to have to say, I can come up with $15 every month while I want to do this project. So I wanted to make it a service that we could offer as a campus. And so that's, that's a question. If you have the funds to do that, you can yeah, just buy an off the shelf solution. It's going to be easy to get set up and running. On the other hand, if you have, um, access to some of those technical resources that are happy to collaborate with you on these sort of projects. Um, the barriers to setting that up are really not high. Like um, I, you don't need a ton of technical knowledge. And in fact, I took a lot of inspiration from different blog posts and articles that were written by faculty that wanted to do their own podcasting setups um, and, and use some of those tools and piece them together. Um, I will say at my institution, the problem wasn't even so much financial um, as cultural. So people asking questions like, wait, 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 we're gonna let people put podcasts out with our like official logo on it. Like, what if they say something that we don't like, you know? So those are the questions that um, were the stopping point for the, for the project at my institution. So if we ever get around to readdressing this project, those, those would be the questions that we would have to answer. Solid, thank you. Um, another question for Kristen. How did you address the support email situation? I guess you shouldn't hear my laughing. It's me, right? So it was just a lot of email and there are times when I just have to go out for a walk. I mean, there's, I, I, it's an opportunity to get to really know the participants and 
I don't know if any of you have had those experiences where you're like, oh, any person could come and stay at my house because we had such a bonded group. I feel a bit like that of, you know, there are many people in Africa now that I'm like, oh yeah, oh, how's your son and how's your ankle and did you get your car fixed? Um, and taking it more as an opportunity to meet more people and expand my awareness. They've sent so many thank you gifts. Um, I'm not in a part of my house, as, but you know, there are all these little gifts. Uh, it's very sweet, but it is time consuming and at the end of the day, um, it is a global outreach uh, public mission project that's not sustainable. <laughs> and so it is probably going to be below the line um, with budget cuts, but you know, it's definitely a happy place project for me. There's lots of amazing people and I feel like we've had great impact, but it's time consuming. You've men you mentioned sustainability um, a number of times. Um, for clarity, are you talking about money? Are you talking about time? Are you talking about staffing? What do you what do you mean by the sustainability and all of the above? It, it has none of the above. So um, it has a lot of great people that are trying their best and doing free things. Um, so right. money, time, and people would be great. All right. So does anybody have? Because um, we're just about. Um, at our time, does anybody have any pieces of final parting wisdom about what they spoke about or just pretty much um, continuing to teach and work online in the COVID era? I would Take just care say, of yourself. Uh, yeah, feel free to innovate because that's, that's you know, what's going to keep us ready for any kind of new crisis and just to serve our students' needs. And this is a great session to talk about innovation. I really appreciate the other panelists and the work they did for today. That's great. Um, since we're almost at time and we would definitely welcome continual communications and discussions. So if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out either to me or to our speakers. And we've chatted a little bit in the back end and um, I think everyone is happy to share their slides. Um, we, after the whole series, we will we'll post everything on our website. Um, but if you have the need to get the materials earlier, just let me know. We're happy to help. Okay, with that said, I will conclude today's session. And thank you again for coming, everyone. I'll see you at some other sessions this summer. Take care. <laughs>